Um, it's wonderful to be here with you, Dr. Smithies. Um, I was wondering if you could just start by telling us a little bit about the work that you did that you won your, your Nobel Prize for. Uh, uh, yes, I will, uh, Eliza. But uh, before I start, uh, I just wanted to uh, say uh, that I think it's a privilege for me to be here uh, with all you people who help our university. It's, uh, I, I'm in a sense uh, inside the university helping outwards, and you're an outside University helping inwards, many of you, and uh, it's uh, a privilege to be here and and uh, uh, participate with you in this morning's affairs. You you ask me how what is the work that uh, that uh, was recognised? Well, I think I, maybe I'll use a rather silly sort of metaphor, if you like, of of, of what it was. Imagine that you are a a visitor from outer space, not uh, a border visitor, but you're a visitor from outer space, <laughs> and um, uh, you're in an, oh, oh, you've been, uh, ended up by being in an automobile uh, right, driving down the road. And uh, you, do, you don't know what an automobile is yet uh, very much, and you're banging around, and you knock out the light in the, in the ceiling of the car, and uh, you find you, can't read your watch anymore because even visitors from outer space have watches. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, so you learn that the, the, the light is not terribly important. But you bang around some more and you knock off the steering wheel. And then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and so you learn that the steering wheel is important. So in a way, that's the sort of work, Eliza, that I've that I was uh, part of, is learning how to understand what genes are important in, in, in um, I was working with a mouse, but 90% um, of the genes in a mouse are the same as the genes in humans, so we're 90% mice. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, uh, if, you, if you can then knock out a gene, you see, uh, you can find out whether it's like the light in the ceiling and is not terribly important, or you can find out if it's important. And that uh, turns out to be a very powerful way of learning what genes do, because you just knock them out. Now, actually, my own work since do, uh, getting that started has not been uh, on gene knockout. I've been more interested in, in things that... Uh, make us all different sizes and shapes. I mean, we, some of us are long and skinny, and some of us are wide and short, and some of us are too wide. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and these are things which are partly controlled genetically. But they aren't due to absence of things. We, it isn't a knockout. It's just something that makes each one of us a little bit different, a quantitative difference, not a qualitative difference. And I've been interested in that sort of thing with relation to blood pressure and, uh, uh, quite a lot. Uh, so maybe 10 or 15 years of my work has been related to that. So you won the Nobel Prize with, with two other scientists. You, you shared it with them. And I was wondering if you could perhaps share any wisdom you've learned about what it takes to work, work with a group over the years. I'm sure you've gained some. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> deaf, Eliza. You're going to have to say that again a bit slower. <laughs> Well, um, I was just wondering what you've learned through the years working with other scientists. You, you shared the Nobel Prize with two others. Maybe what you've learned in terms of what it takes to work with a group. Well, I, I think the, the, the single most important thing is if, if you want to work with other people, and we all do at various times, because we need to uh, explore a part of science uh, that we don't know much about. And so we go and ask for help. <laughs> Well, maybe I can put it back to your first uh, question, in a way, because there's a very good example of that. Because uh, the work that, I, that my, uh, I was doing with my lab was concerned with how to alter genes. And um, uh, I, my whole aim at first was to learn how to correct genes that are faulty. For example, like the cystic fibrosis gene or, or some <coughs> e easier genes, as it were, easier in terms of technical things, like the genes which control whether we, we have normal hemoglobin or whether we have sickle cell anemia. And it's, that's a very simple difference, but, and there's only one gene, and so you ought to be able to correct that gene. 
And that was my motivation originally to do the work. Well, I tried some experiments and my particular success was in showing that it was possible to alter a gene. But it was terribly inefficient. I mean, I, could, I would start with a million cells and only one of them would have the gene corrected. <laughs> so it really wasn't any use for uh, helping people uh, as a therapy yet. Uh, but uh, I heard of the work of uh, another scientist and uh, he was the person who first found out about embryonic stem cells. And most of you have heard various little things about that or big things. But embryonic stem cells are cells which uh, can be grown in a dish in, a, in the laboratory and can still go back into a, into a, a pregnant female mouse and you get, him, and you get a, an offspring which is made from the embryonic stem cell. So they, these cells are really like mice in tissue culture. You've got a mouse in a dish. And, you can, and, I, and I thought that it would be a good idea to not to, to use this method of altering genes, even if it was very efficient, I could use it with the cells of uh, uh, stem cells. Now, the person who was, whose name it was was Martin Evans, and he was one of the Nobel laureates. Uh, that we shared the Nobel Prize with another person. I'll tell you about too. And so I called up Martin Evans, and, or sent him, I don't think, it, it was before the days of email. <laughs> <laughs> so I either called him or something and, and asked him if he would bring some of his cells. And so he walked into the lab one day, he was in, in England, and, but he'd been visiting in the States. He walked into the lab and he reached in his pocket and he pulled a tube out and he said, here you are, Oliver. And he had a tube of his cells which he gave me. <laughs> And here, there were no strings attached to it. <laughs> there was nothing other than here is one scientist helping another. And, and that's the key to working with other people. That you have to be unselfish and you have to help. And if you're collaborating, don't think about what's in it for you. That's obvious. Think about what's in it for your collaborator. And if you look after the needs of your collaborator, it will work. And another little history, because it, it's fascinating to me, is that uh, Mario Capecchi, who was the third member of the, of, the, of the trio, had been doing similar work to my work in Salt Lake City. And we knew we were working on the same sort of general thing, and we would meet at meetings, and we would chat. We, didn't, we weren't feeling to be competing or anything, but we were just working on the same problem. And we both realized the need to, to approach Martin Evans, uh, for his embryonic stem cell. And you know, that was within, the, it was within three weeks, completely independently, we went to talk to Martin Evans. And so that's the way science goes, and, and, and that's the joy of, of collaboration. And another thing on, on that, oh, you've got me going. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, an, it's a neat topic, um, that I had a, a collaboration two with people who I'd co corresponded with and either sent them something or they'd sent me something. And one was uh, uh, in, in France. The, these uh, scientists had been working on the genetic factors which affect problems that develop in, uh, develop in individuals who have diabetes. And one of the more serious complications is kidney disease. And uh, he, he uh, the person in uh, France, Paris, Francois Alain Jolas is his name. Well, Francois wrote to me asking me for, his, uh, for some mice of, that we'd made that he thought would uh, help him solve the, his problem. So we sent the mouse, and, uh, and I never met him, but we published a paper together. And then I went to a meeting in New York uh, to talk at a scientific meeting about the work I've been doing. And I said, you know, and we've been doing this work with uh, Francois Alain Gillas, uh, and it's been very uh, enjoyable. But, uh, you know, I've never met him. But it, it, he's supposed to be coming to this meeting, and this guy gets up at the back and says, 
And, and uh, then later on, oh, he's a fabulous person. Later on, I visited his lab in Paris, and he's lived in Paris all his life. And um, he can drive in Paris traffic. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he took us around Paris at about five o'clock in the afternoon, you know, the, the worst time. And he knew every little byway to get through this and that and the other. And, we had a, a grand time. <laughs> so collaborations, and colla it's very easy if you do it on a friendly basis. And I have so many friends from collaborations. It's just like, well, they're off, like brothers and sisters, you might say. Now, obviously, you've been, you've been working in science a long time, but um, so you've seen remarkable changes in technology, I imagine. I was just wondering what, what you would say has been the most, maybe the most remarkable change in technology that you've seen in, in your lifetime. Well, I suppose um, probably the one, that, uh, the two go together. Um, that one is first, uh, it almost goes in three. Uh, first of all, the discovery that DNA was the genetic material, and that was done by scientists in Rockefeller. It was Rockefeller Institute at that time in New York. And, and for some reason or other, they ne never got the Nobel Prize. They should have. Everybody thinks they should. But anyway, they showed that DNA was the genetic material. And, and, um, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, Francis Crick and Jim uh, Watson worked out uh, the, how, how DNA goes together, as it were. And um, uh, then Fred Sanger uh, worked out, uh, and uh, Wally Gilbert, Two, in two different labs, one in England and one in, the, in Massachusetts, um, worked out how to sequence uh, uh, DNA. And now we, uh, the methods of sequencing have got so good that you can take the whole of the genetic material of a human and determine every letter in the, uh, in the uh, you might say, the dictionary of a human. And I think those are the most exciting things for me because it's like you've been given the blueprint of humans. But you don't understand what all the parts are. And that's the exciting thing for the future and that maybe I have a little contribution to. Uh, finding out what the bits do now. And then using that to help. But that's the most exciting. So it's really all of the things related to DNA and understanding what and understanding how to determine a human genome mm -hmm. a sequence. You, you know, there's one thing I... In the early days of the gene, of gene cloning, not, uh, not of cloning uh, animals or anything, just uh, uh, cloning pieces of DNA, I had uh, some visitors who were a little bit worried about this technique, and uh, I think actually it was a religious group, but I don't remember what particular... <laughs> religion they were thinking about. <laughs> but uh, we met in the library, and I tried to tell them what, what this cloning was about. And I said, well, look at, the, look at the bo all of these books on this wall. And, that, and I picked up a big book, a really big, thick book. I said, look at this book. It has a 1,000 pages in it. And on each page, there are a 1,000 letters. Therefore, there are altogether uh, a million uh, le letters in this book. Now, how many letters are in the human genome? And the answer is you would have to have 3,000 books like that to write out the letters that are in the human genome. And so learning how to do that is a fabulous thing. And then learning how to pick a book out of that and say, I want to look at this book. I want to look at page 27 in volume 2,976, page 320. And that we can do now. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, you've been in Chapel Hill a long time, but are you, are you still working and in what capacity? Oh, I, 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 no, I'm not working. I, I've, ne I've never done a day's work in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I play. <laughs> you see, that's the neat thing about, about science, is if you enjoy it, it doesn't work. You have to do some things which are 
a little bit tedious. I'm writing a grant this, uh, at the moment. But I, can't, I, I had a good idea before I came to see you guys. Uh, I, I got up a bit early and I was giving a copy of the grant to my wife. And I thought, well, I, 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 oh, we can do this little work thing in this way. So that happened. But, you know, I, I, I had to go to uh, give a talk sometime to uh, retired people. And, uh, and I asked them, I said, I'm going to give you three names. And I said, I'm going to ask you what there is in common with these three names. And, and one of the names was um, uh, Francis Crick, and everybody under, understood that. And then another name was Wanda Landowska, and nobody understood that. And, um, and one was Rex Harrison. Well, I, I said, what's common about these things? Well, I said, Rex Harrison is a famous actor. Wanda Landowska plays the harpsichord. And Francis Crick is a scientist. Oh, I think actually he used Picasso. It was Picasso. Picasso. He's a famous uh, painter, uh, artist. And what they have in common is they're all over 80, and they're all still doing what they don't like to do. They don't need the money. They do it because it's deep inside them. So they aren't working. They're playing. So I'm still playing. <laughs> <laughs> now, can you tell me a little bit about um, maybe your childhood or, or what brought you, um, created your interest in science? Well, I think, I, I, think, uh, I think probably I always think, uh, this may be imaginary, but I think it's, it's what I imagine. It's what I remember. That I, I, I had a, a comic strip that I liked. It was a comic strip about an inventor. And this inventor was always inventing neat things. And uh, I thought I'd like to be an inventor. I, I didn't know the word scientist, so I didn't know what a scientist was. So I said, I'd, I, I'd like to be an inventor. And that was sort of uh, quite a, uh, early. And then, through one of those accidents of life, as it were, I got rheumatic fever when I was about seven. So I had to go to, uh, the, in those days, they didn't know what to do with you when you had strep throat rheumatic fever. And, and I was p put in bed for 10 weeks, a seven-year-old in bed for 10 weeks, my God. And um, absolutely unnecessary, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I had. So I had to read a lot. And I, I got to enjoy reading a great deal. I think that was one thing. And, and then as, as a result of that, I wasn't allowed to play sports until I till I was 14, and I imagine a, a boy not able to play sports, and I, so I was hopeless at sports when I started at 14. <laughs> I, I couldn't hit a ball worth anything. Uh, but, I, but I'd enjoyed uh, learning about things and about science, and uh, I, I think it was sort of just in me for a long time, really. So I understand you, you have your pilot's license, is that right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, is there anything about flying or, or being a pilot, um, maybe lessons you've learned there that you can apply elsewhere? Well, yes, I, uh, I, I still fly. I was flying on uh, last Sunday, and I hope to fly tomorrow. It's a, 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 a nice day tomorrow. And, um, but um, I think I've been, an, I'm, I've also been an instructor in flying. And, uh, you know, many of the students who come to learn to fly are frightened, really. Uh, and I remember being a bit that way, too. And so you can be learning to do something, and you're frightened. And what you learn to, uh, to, to understand is that you can teach the student, by teaching them how to do things, to overcome this fear. And it's a very real thing. Um, it, uh, for example, when I was learning to fly instrument flying, uh, the instructor sits in this seat, and I'm sitting in this seat. And it's very hot in this seat. I'm always sweating. And <laughs> sweat is dripping off me. And I, I had a good day one time. I turned to my instructor, whose name was Field. I said, Field, you know, this was a good day. Only one drop dripped. <laughs> And, and I had a student who was uh, learning to fly gliders with me, and in the glider, the students in front, you're behind. 
and, and he would, his shirt would be absolutely soaking when he finished the lesson. And then the time came when he went by himself for the first time, when he went solo. And he came back, he was walking like a king, and he came back and he said, look, Oliver, dry. <laughs> and so it's overcoming fear with knowledge. And that applies just the same to science. People are frightened of going into something new because they think it's much too difficult. And the other person looks the other way and says, I couldn't do what he's doing or she's doing it much too hard. So each one is frightened of what the other's work is and they can overcome that fear by, with knowledge. And so it's very much the same thing. And I've, I've found that uh, many parallels between the two. And the, method, and the things you get taught to do when you're learning to be an instructor apply very much to um, uh, science as well. So you let people make mistakes, for example. That's also true in flying. You let the student make mistakes because if they don't make mistakes, they won't learn. But you have to have a sense of how many, <laughs> how serious a mistake can be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I was learning to be an instructor, uh, and now my instructor is in the back, and I have a student here, and I'm instructing this student, and this student makes a mistake when we're landing, you know, and you know it, and these mistakes happen. And so you take over control and say, I've got it, and you fly them out of this um, thing. And, and so I turned back and I said to uh, my instructor, and I said, uh, did I uh, take over at the right time? And he I swallowed like that and said, I, I could have wished it was half a second earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but the same thing with a student in science, you see. You let them, if it's a mistake, it's going to cost them a week's uh, work. Uh, you don't say very much. Uh, well, maybe you, you might, <clears throat> yeah, oh, you might say, oh, oh. oh. Uh, if it's going to cost them a couple of weeks, you sort of hint. And if it's going to cost six months' work, you better get in there and take over. So that's the same sort of thing, you see. So I'm 21. I'm a senior here at UNC, and I'm trying to decide what I'll do next year and in the future. Um, I was just wondering, what advice would you give me or maybe your own 21-year-old self if you were to look back? And oh, yes, I think I can give you some good <laughs> advice on that. Because, uh, <laughs> because yeah, I think it applies very much to, to all of our... Uh, things in life. Pick something that you enjoy. That's the most single most important thing. Because if you don't enjoy it, you aren't going to do very well at it. And uh, it, uh, you can obviously say, I would like to do something that's important. That's fine, and that's an, a good thing to have in your mind. But don't do something important if you don't like it, because it isn't going to help, because it won't work. So. Pick something that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It was wonderful to, to hear from everybody. Um, it was wonderful well, to, to talk with you. Oh, OK. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.